Okay, so next up we look at uh, a very different uh, area called hardware security modules and ways of accessing these hardware security modules using security APIs or what uh, the author also refers to as transaction sets. So what is a security API or a transaction set? It is an application programming interface, so that's what API stands for. That is a bunch of functions that you can call or commands that you can issue or transactions that you can uh, send that allows a user, so now the user is really a program that you are running to work with sensitive data and keys and use cryptography to enforce that a protocol or policy is in place for the use of this data. So we'll see more of this when we get to the chapter on banking and bookkeeping and also encryption. So this is just a really a preview. So what you'll have is usually a host um, PC with either a plug-in PCI co card or a separate module that the host can use to communicate and it does some processing here that's in a secure way. Why? Because you could probably do the same thing in the host but there's hosts these days are so wide open and so full of bugs that you don't trust the host to do things securely and there are some things that you want to keep secret inside the security module and you provide a limited number of things that you can call, functions that you can call, or transactions or commands that you can issue to do things ideally in a secure way. So you access this hardware security module using this security API or transaction set as we'll see in the coming chapters. Okay, so what exactly are these hardware security modules? You can think of them as instantiations of security APIs. They're often uh, physically tamper-resistant uh, pieces of hardware that, ha that have epoxy like all over it so that you can't take a look and see what chips are being used and stuff like that. They also have temperature sensors, so if it gets too hot or if it looks like there's an X-ray beam trained on this um, device on this hardware module then it automatically like wipes out everything stuff like that often these hardware security modules will have har hardware based cryptography acceleration which is actually becoming not so important with uh, most modern processors uh, in PCs having um, instruction support for things like cryptography. PCs, I mean, CPUs are basically fast enough. It used to be that they weren't, and so you would rely on these hardware modules to do it, to, to do cryptography really fast. But the important thing is that they are trusted, and they have special trusted peripherals, key switches, or smart card readers, keypads, things like that, that are tightly controlled, that you cannot uh, spoof, things like that, ideally. So from now on, we'll refer to these hardware security modules as HSMs. You'll see that abbreviation a lot. So the two types of HSMs we'll look at are the IBM 4758, just a classic, one of the first ones, and was pretty reliable for a long time, and then the Visa security module, or VSM. Okay, so this is what it looks like. It could be a plug-in card with a number of connections. It could be a complete standalone box outside. Uh, here's another example of a card that you plug in and here's another one that's not exactly a PCI card maybe meant for a server so these HSMs go into both ATMs into PCs into servers all over the place and this is roughly what they look like you know, standalone or not standalone like plug-in devices or standalone cards Okay, so why is this all important? Well, when ATMs came widely into use, ATM security was the killer app that brought cryptography into the commercial mainstream. Before that, nobody used, not many people used cryptography um, all the time, except for people like spies and you know, military people. But once ATMs got into use, then security was really important so that you couldn't have people stealing money. That was the main 
thing you want to protect against wasn't made really a secret so much as uh, money that you want to protect. And so um, you need a concrete security policies for these APIs. For example, things like only the customer should know his or her PIN, things like that. So as long as you enforce this policy, it made it so that you, know, you couldn't, there was no way for bank employees, say, or um, mail people to figure out pins that all these things were well hidden, then um, you, know, you can be sure that uh, your security policy would work. So there were some standard pin processing transactions, but there were many ways of implementing this from different vendors using hardware uh, to keep these pins and encryption keys from the bank staff. IBM, for example, made the common core um, manual. I mean, I'm forgetting what CCA means, but it's in a in a slide for you know, a couple of slides down. It made the CCA manual available online, which had a excellent detailed description of the API that IBM was using. It was a good explanation of background pin processing APIs. And unfortunately, IBM also had lots of uncatalogued weaknesses. And that's what uh, the author was actually involved in looking at quite a bit. So if you look in a network, you have an ATM that communicates with an acquiring bank. And so that is the bank that owns the ATM essentially. And then let's say you're using a card that doesn't belong to this bank, but let's say your bank, which is not the bank that owns the ATM, then the ATM has to communicate with one bank and the bank communicates with the issuing bank that is the bank that issued your ATM, the card that you're using at the ATM. And then this issuing bank will talk to uh, something like a regional headquarters or your branch or something like that. And what you'll see is that all along this path, you'll see HSMs or hardware security modules. So there's a, there will definitely be a hardware security module in the ATM with a keypad. And then that's how you communicate with the acquiring bank, which also has an HSM to keep all things, to keep these things all secret, encrypted. You go across this network full of HSMs, everything's encrypted to the issuing bank you know, still using HSMC. What you'll see is all along the path you should see um, from, the, from the point where the user communicates with some device, you should see HSMs, hardware security modules, all the way to your bank. And then your bank okays the PIN number, card number, and all that, and then a transaction, and all this information goes back and forth. So that's the idea of HSMs. Let's take a quick look at how pins are generated so that you can understand you know, how these HSMs are used. So how are your pin numbers generated? So this was usually how it was used early on. may not be exactly how it's used right now, but you start with your bank account number or primary account number. So it would be some 16-digit code typically, not always, but usually it's some 16-digit code. Then what you do is you use a pin derivation key, and we'll talk about these, PDKs more, and you use the PDK to encrypt this entire primary account number. So you can think of that as a protocol, you know, curly braces around the PAN, using the PDK as the key, you generate this hexadecimal number, you chop off just the first four digits, and then you decimalize because most people um, don't want to type in letters and numbers. They just want to type in numbers that most people expect to enter uh, just numbers for a pin number. And so you have to convert whatever um, uh, set of hex digits that you get to decimal numbers. And simple, simple way to decimalize, and we'll talk about alternatives later, is to convert A to a 0, B to a 1, C to a 2, D to a 3, and so on. So 2 to BD, the 2 and 2 are fine, the B gets decimalized to a 1, and the D gets decimalized to a 3. So you end up with a pin number of 2213 for this particular PAN, or primary account number. Okay, so it's, once again, you take the PAN, encrypt it using a PDK, pin derivation key, you take the first four digits, hex digits there, and then convert them to decimal using some decimalization table, 
and this we just use for in our example we just use really a really straightforward decimalization so are you stuck with this pin number no you can change your pin but what happens is you have to compute some offset between the original derived pin and your chosen pin so a bank record would have something like this let's say you have this uh, primary account number this is a different one from before associated with a name and let's say some balance this came from uh, uh, this was a this person was a friend of the author and so it's really just a made up number but we can think of these um, balances as um, it can be dollars or pounds and initially you might have a pin offset of zero which means you just take whatever this pan number is encrypted take the first four hex digits decimalize and so let's say we for this particular pan number you get the pin number 4426 now let's say for whatever reason um, this person wants to use the pin number 1979 all you have to do is compute out an offset that is what do you add to this to get this what do you add to the old key to get the new key and that offset is what you have to store often um, in your bank record or maybe even your card and once again this you know both of these things have to be decimal numbers decimal digits so it's digit by digit modulo 10 operation so if you use modulo operation in Java you understand what this is but this is not just adding these two things it's digit by digit so you add 3 to the 6 to give you 9 you add the 2 and the 5 to give you 7 you add the 4 and the 5 to give you 9 and then 4 and 7 gives you 11 but you do modulo 10 and so you get a 1 hope that makes sense it's just a simple modulo operation so there were a couple of quite a few attacks over the years we'll go over them later one of them was the offset calculation attack that came about uh, almost 30 years ago so a bank adds a new command to the API to calculate the offset between the new generated pin and the customer's chosen pin right but uh, it turns out that possessing possessing a bank account gives uh, the person who's doing this programming knowledge of one generated pin and then you can use that uh, to reveal any customer's pin by calculating the offset between it and the known pin using this new pan number so you can use an old pan, old offset, and if it turns out that there is a protocol point or a security protocol that allows this, where you enter, you that is the programmer enters into this card reader, uh, these, th these three things, and you get back a new offset, then you can basically, it turns out, figure out anybody's um, pin number, any, uh, any customer's pin number by supplying a new primary account number. So that was a weakness, and actually programmers were, you know, caught doing this exact thing. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, uh, Visa security modules in the in the in the next uh, video.